Thanks for joining us today at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. We're lighting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen today as Pastor Green shares some biblical truths that will shine upon the true light, Jesus Christ. The church is, is families coming together and being a part of the family of God, corporately. But today I want to share with you from uh, Mark chapter 8. If you don't mind, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. The Bible says in, we're going to start in verse 27 of Mark chapter 8. Okay, if you will just uh, follow along in your Bibles and let's look at these scriptures here. Mark eight twenty seven. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi, I believe is how you say that. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others say you're one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say you? that I am. And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priest and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he spake that, saying openly. And Peter, again, took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and he looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. If you would, bow your heads and let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you for the word of the Lord today. Truly, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we seek you today that you would speak to our hearts whatever you will to say through this message today. Help us to perceive it in truth, not be deceived in any way, for not condemnation to come to us, for there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. But help us to receive this word today. Should it need to correct us because you chasten those you love, you offer us correction in love as a good father does. So, Lord, if, it needs to be, if we need to be corrected in any area today, we pray that by your Spirit, by your word, we would be corrected and receive it and receive your instruction today that we thereby may grow as we do desire this sincere milk of the word and even the meat of the word today. We want to grow. We want to grow up. We want to grow in your kingdom. And we just ask you today to feed us. Give us this day our daily bread. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. Okay. This is some pretty interesting verses, to say the least. Um, Jesus here reveals his divine plan and purpose and for his life. He says, this is my divine plan and purpose for my life. I'm going to experience suffering, um, the cross, and death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus is finally telling his disciples what his divine will, according to God, is. But Peter. Somebody say, but Peter. Now, Peter, let's look what happens first. Peter, when Jesus asks... What do they say? What's the, what's the people you talk to out here say about me? And 
They say he's everything but who he is. They don't know him as Christ. They say you're one of the prophets. They say you're even John the Baptist. They say you're even Elias. But all of them miss it. Nobody acknowledges that he's the Christ. But Peter acknowledges that Jesus is Christos. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the one sent to save the world. Peter gets it. Nobody else of the other uh, disciples get it. Just Peter. Now, another gospel says this. Jesus speaks to him. It doesn't say it in this one, but he says, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So Peter received the revelation that Jesus was, is, and will forever be the Christ. You are the Christ. So Peter's like, I got it. I got revelation before all you guys. And then in the next breath, Jesus tells them his divine will and purpose for his life involving suffering, you know, being persecuted, going through suffering, being rejected by the elders, by the scribes, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to... Uh, be buried, but I'm going to rise again. And what does Peter do? He rebukes Jesus. First thing you do, never rebuke Jesus. Never make the mistake to rebuke Jesus. That's what I would say to Peter. Right? Never make the mistake and rebuke Jesus. The way, the truth, the life. Christ. But he did it. He, he, he rebuked him. It said, uh, Peter took him. Come with me. <laughs> Who you think you are, boy? Come with me, Jesus. And he began to rebuke Jesus. I, I play videos in my head when I'm reading, and I'm thinking, oh, no. <laughs> this is backwards. He should not be rebuking the one he just called Christ and got by revelation. So he had knowledge of who he was before he did it. Do y'all see this? He already had knowledge that Jesus was the Christ when he took him away and began to rebuke him as he was revealing truth to them. Somebody say, Peter messed up. Woo, he messed up. This was the same one that Jesus said to him, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not be prevailed. Remember that? Now what is Jesus calling? What is he saying? Is he calling Peter Satan? Or has Peter become the spokesperson for Satan? Now it says here, let's read it again. But when he had turned about, verse 33, so he turned about. I want you to visualize that. He turns away from Peter. And it says he looked on his disciples. So he's turned away from Peter and he's looking at his disciples. I'm assuming he's got his back to him. And what does he say? Get behind me, Satan. He's rebuking Satan and telling Satan to get behind him. Why? Because he savors not. He desires not the things that be of God. How many of you know Satan doesn't desire the things that be of God to take place? But they're going to anyway because God has the last say so. His will will be done. Amen. And it says, For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So Peter rebukes Jesus, and then Jesus turns around and rebukes Satan because Satan was speaking under inspiration of not the Holy Ghost that time, but of Satan himself. As I began to look at this, I said, Lord, one minute Peter is receiving revelation and the next minute he's a spokesman for Satan. 
That tells us what flesh can do. How many of you believe that we're even capable, if we're not very careful, to become spokespersons for Satan? How many of you know when we're gossiping, Satan's using our mouth? When we're backbiting somebody, Satan's using our mouth. But we don't look at it. Sometimes we say, what have I done? I haven't done anything wrong. And we're wiping our mouth saying, I haven't done anything wrong. This opened my eyes to show me that I have to be very careful with my mouth and what I say about those that are especially of God. God says, touch not my anointed and do my servants the prophets no harm. The Bible says that it is an acceptable thing with God to deal out retribution to those that cause you trouble. And you trouble means those that's doing his will and divine plan for their life. And then somebody else is giving you trouble and, and, and making your life difficult. It's not good for them if they do it. Amen? Sometimes people might say something to me about somebody that I know is called of God. And, you know, I know we say things sometimes lightheartedly. But I'm talking about when you... Because we're all different, right? Right? But I'm talking about when there's serious assault on a person's character, on a person's intentions. And I think that's where we miss it a lot. Is we think we know what they were thinking. Well, you better know before you go accusing somebody because you could be being used by Satan and be a false accuser of the brethren. Now... I said, okay, I think I see what you were doing. And it shows me how susceptible we can be. That he was used by God and suddenly he allowed his flesh to not listen to what the Lord was saying to him. He should have been listening more than talking. You see, he, he spoke the first time, and he thought, I, he might have thought, whoo, I got the answer right that time. I was the first one to say, you're the Christ. So he tried to belt out again when he needed to just be quiet. When Jesus told him what the plan was going to be, you would have thought Peter would have said, okay, he's the Christ. I just got revelation of that. Wow. You know, I can trust what he's saying is going to happen. But he didn't do any of that. He rebuked him. He took him away and rebuked him. It's hard to believe, isn't it? I'm like, really? He did that? When he says, this is Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, it tells me that we, the church, can be susceptible of the same things Peter was susceptible with, and therefore we have to be extra careful, and that's why I'm teaching on it today, so that we can be extra careful and not allow the devil to use his devices to bring division and discord in the body of Christ. Can I hear an amen? Because that's what he likes to do. Satan savors not the things that be of God. He savors the things that be of men, of the flesh, the will of men. Wow. Wow. Now, I want you to look a little bit further down. We're going to read in verse 34. And we're going to read 34 through 38. Because what Jesus says next is pretty important to what he said previously. And when he had called the people unto him with the disciples also, he said unto them. Now, he's calling the people and his disciples together. And he said, whosoever will come after me. 
Let him deny himself. Now, Jesus just told him, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And who wants to come with me? <laughs> Anybody want to come with me? Watch this. Now, imagine you're standing there, and Jesus announces what's fixing to happen to him, and he asks you, Sister Diana, would you like to come with me? And it said, he says, and whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for what? For my sake and for the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. Let me ask you this. Have you lost your life? For Jesus' sake and the sake of the gospel, have you given up your right to do life yourself, your own way, according to men, rather than to follow Christ? Because if you save your life and live it according to what you want to do with it, not caring what the Lord's will is, our plan is, our purpose is for life, you're going to lose your life eternally. But if you lose it now, you'll save it then. After you're gone from here, we'll go to heaven. If we lose it for His sake and the Gospels. That means we give up and surrender over to Him our life completely. Not doing what we want to do with it, but seeking His will that we would do whatever He wills for us to do. And we know what His will is for the most part because we have it written. It is written. People say, is it God's will for you to go to church? You don't have to ask that. It is written. Is it God's will for us to forgive one another when we have ought? Yes, it's God's will. We forgive. How do you know? Because it's written. So he talks about this, and then he says, For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now he's talking to them about if they hold on to their life and do not leave it to follow him if they don't deny themselves take up their cross and follow him daily they're going to lose their life eternally this word and this message is still true today you have to get to the place in your heart where I surrender all I surrender all of my life to you Jesus not a piece not a part but all, and to follow you. He says, think about it. He's trying to get the people to reason. And he says, come on, what would it profit you if you live for fame and riches and you got everything money could buy in this world and only died and lost your soul eternity, eternally in hell. How would that profit you? Somebody say it wouldn't. And then he asked the next critical question, which per relates to this one. He says, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, what's so important to you in this life that you would give it in exchange for your soul? Is money, is wealth, is riches, is a name? What is it that is preventing you from denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus daily, whatever that is, is what you're giving in exchange for your soul. Is it worth it? Come on, there's things God's going to 
He's going to ask you to lay down. There's things God's going to ask you to give up. And there's nothing that he's going to ask you to lay down or give up that will not be more beneficial for you than having it. I'm preaching good right now. If he asks you to give it up, he's going to give you the real thing. He's going to give you not the counterfeit that Satan has been giving you. But Jesus is into giving you that which leads to eternal life. That which is fulfilling. That which satisfies the soul. That which causes you to prosper. That which causes you to be in good health. He's going to give you that which is only good for you. God will not give you anything that is not good for you. It may not feel good at the moment. When God has asked me, he doesn't tell me I have to do it. He doesn't make me do it. He asks me, will you? Lay that down for me. Will you leave that for me? Will you do this for me? He won't make you do it. He is going to let you and me have free will until he comes back. He gave the angels free will. And a third of them followed Satan and were cast out of heaven. They got what they chose you and I are going to get whatever we choose it won't be God and Jesus fault if we go to hell it'll be because of what we chose or didn't choose people say well Jesus sends people to hell no he doesn't people send themselves to hell because they refuse to receive the truth just like he was doing he refused to receive the truth. When Jesus spoke the truth, he rejected it. He said, not so, when Jesus said so. And he was a spokesman for Satan. And we know the rebuke worked because Peter received that rebuke. And it was the harshest rebuke of any Christian I see believer in the Bible. I would hate for Jesus to walk up and say, when I open my mouth and speak, him say, get behind me, Satan. I'd probably go in a hole. I'd just, I'd just tell you, I'm gone for a while. I got to go chew on this a minute, you know. It was a bad thing to be rebuked to that degree. He had to think about it. Man, I was letting Satan speak through me. But he was repentant. You know, we see Peter as a top of the church. Hmm. Sometimes we need to listen more than talk. Be slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to listen, quick to forgive. How long do we hold grudges? Have you got a grudge against anybody today? If you've got a grudge against anybody today, you need to work it out with God first. And then work it out with a person. If you have unforgiveness to, towards someone, you need to work it out this way first and then that way. And follow the leadership of God after you work it out with him. He'll lead us. Sometimes he'll tell you to leave it alone. Sometimes he'll tell you to go to him. Sometimes he'll just say, forgive it and move on. Don't even acknowledge it anymore. So it's important when something goes wrong in relationships, take it to the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, something went wrong. Lord, I'm hurt. Lord, I'm offended. Lord, they ticked me off. Lord, I'm really, really mad right now at so-and-so. 
Do you know that God expects us to be honest with him in everything that we can't fake him out? I tell him everything, and I tell him before I usually tell other people. (laughs) Usually. (laughs) Usually. But I have on occasion, many times, many times, been a Peter. Just spouted off what I got to say. And might have even been a spokesman for Satan. How many of you have ever let your mouth overload your hiney and you knew pretty soon by the you look at you listen to yourself and you think oh man some foul language is coming out and here's the scriptures that God always reminded me of since I've been a Christian when you're insulted do not insult in return Uh (laughs) uh-oh when you're reviled do not revile back Come on. Now, growing up means you're going to be doing less of this. Grow up in the Lord. You'll be less likely to act like you did when you were a child. And I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about man versus spirit man versus flesh man. Paul said, when, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. But now that I'm a man, come on, he grew up. He started growing up and his speech changed. The way he handled things changed. How many of you, you know right now that you've changed? That if some people were to say what they said to you last week, you might have punched their lights out 10 years ago. But yesterday, you just said, bless them, Lord. I pray for them. Forgive them in Jesus' name. Amen. You just went on your merry way and just kept on going. That's because you're growing up. I'm telling you, the word helps. Seeing Peter, I thank God. To me, I'd be real embarrassed if I was the one that Jesus put in the Bible for all the world to read. I'd say, well, thank you, Jesus. The least you could have do is covered me and not told everybody that you had to rebuke me and I was Satan's spokesperson. Right? Come on, that's how I'd feel. I was like, at least you wouldn't, didn't have to put it in the Bible, Jesus, and tell everybody and use me as an example. It was bad enough, I messed up, but then you told everybody. And here 2,000 years later in Lighthouse, they're up here teaching about it and exposing me again. Thank you, Jesus. But I say this, if Peter were here today, I would say thank you, Peter. Because I'm trying to learn from your mistakes. How many of us know that we can learn from others' mistakes not to make the same mistake? And if you learn anything in church today, we need to learn to be careful that when we open our mouths that we're not opposing the divine will and plan of God and that we truly are not being used by Satan to speak. Whoa. I've already set the bar. Like, the bar's like probably here. We're going to need the help of the Holy Ghost. Come on, I already say the bar's high now. I'm going to need help, Holy Ghost help. First of all, I know that we cannot do it ourselves. Left to ourselves, we'll fall flat on our face before we ever even probably get in the car and get to Dothan or head home this way. We'll already be had a fuss and say, oops. We'll be insulting each other. We'll be reviling each other. We'll be calling each other, you you stupid. You crazy. We'll be mad at each other and got a grudge against somebody. If we're not careful, 
Because the enemy comes to try to provoke us to get in disagreement, to get in discord, because he knows that we're meant to be together. There was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Father, son, grandson. They were meant to be in covenant relationship with God and each other. But look how the devil has tore apart so many of our families. Sometimes what seems acceptable to the Lord isn't to the naked eye. When somebody else looks at it, they might say, well, I know what I would do if I were in your shoes. Well, you're not. And it's not important what you think. It's not important what others think you should do or shouldn't do. Make sure you get counsel from godly people who don't give you a quick answer in a complicated situation. I'm leery of people that I, I present a complicated situation, maybe something that took years to get here, and then the minute you tell them about it, and maybe you just want them to pray about it, they suddenly counsel you just like that what you need to do. I don't trust people like that. The first thing they should have said is, I will pray for you about that, and if I get a word from God, I'll give it. Otherwise, I'm waiting. Because I don't have a revelation about this yet. Now we're teaching a whole nother thing here this morning. I'm trying to teach you as seasoned brethren to make sure that you're not telling people to do things, counseling them, and you being a spokesperson for Satan. I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, I've got this going on in my life, and what do you think I ought to do? And I'll be like on the other end of the phone saying, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And then I try to think, what would I do? But what I would do may not be what God wants you to do. And I'd say, sometimes I'll say, well, tell me more. And I'll start asking questions. How did you get here? You know, well, what's happened since then? Well, ask questions to learn more about what's happening. Because godly counsel, in godly counsel, there's safety. The Bible says, you know, seek godly counsel, and there's safety in godly counsel. But don't just trust everybody that claims to be of God that they're godly counsel, because some people will tell you to do stuff that is absolutely in error. And if you do it, you're going to follow them, and the blind's going to lead the blind. Y'all going to fall in the pit together. You got to make sure who you're following is Jesus and not men. I've seen many men follow men and get in trouble. No preacher should be saying, you know, just follow me, follow me, follow me, and not be saying follow Jesus. Jesus said, if you want to have eternal life, Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Your first person that should mean more to you about following and knowing and hearing their voice is Jesus. I care more about what Jesus thinks about how I live my life than you. And rightfully so, we all should. I'm telling you, you shouldn't worry about what I think about how you live more than you think about how Jesus thinks. Can I hear an amen this morning? I tell people, sometimes people don't know my heart. If they knew me, they'd know I didn't mean that. How many of you, if people know you, they very rarely, sometimes I'll say, if they knew me. If they really knew me, they would know better than that. How many of you have ever been there? Where, has, has, have you ever been misunderstood? Has, has anybody ever misunderstood you? I believe every one of us in this room could say, if you'll think back, 
I remember being misunderstood. Do you remember how that felt? Just because a person believes something that they believe and they believe that it is as they believe it doesn't mean it's true. That's why it's always best to ask questions. Amen? Sometimes things get resolved when we ask questions. Amen? So he's asking them, in verse 38 he says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this, and he identifies this generation, this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. So he's telling the people that if they want to save their life to lose it, He's dealing with them about living life in this world, this adulterous and sinful generation, after our own vanities, for fame, for riches, for notoriety, for wealth, that that's all we're living and working for. Living for self. And are you going to let this be what cost you your soul for eternity? When you become a Christian, God might... Maybe you worked at a place and God said, I want you to come out. We have a choice. When he asks of us, we can either say yes, we choose to come out, or no, we choose to stay. But it's going to determine if we're in the will of God or we just miss the will of God. And I believe this, as long as we're not in the will of God, we're going to be pretty miserable. And we're going to feel it. And he's going to take patience. He'll patiently wait and sometimes wait for us to grow spiritually to where we can take that giant leap of faith. I've seen God wait for me. I'll say, I'm just not ready to do that. I don't have the faith to do that right now. You know, I'm scared. And he's like, you're scared? I mean, it don't make sense to be scared. I remember the Lord asking me to leave my job of 13 years. And if I walked out, I had no income from it, no insurance for me and my whole family, and forfeited a wonderful job. But the Lord said, come out. We have some great and wonderful things to do together. And you think you're a spiritual giant until... You hear those words and you're a little faithless coward over here scared to death to step out of all that you know that has been your security. Wait, my paycheck. Wait, my family's covered with Blue Cross Blue Shield. What will we do about insurance? And then you realize who you're talking to. Oh, I've been singing that you were my provider. I've been singing on Sunday you were, you were the one who protected us. You were the healer. Now the Lord says, well, if I am, why are you worried about your paycheck? Why are you worried about your insurance? Then we sort of feel like Peter. Oh, Lord. But when we obey the Lord... We have a testimony because every test can lead to a testimony. Amen? 
We get the choice. It's our choice today of whether we're going to live for Christ or whether we're going to live for self. There's more to being born again than just being born again. Being born again is the first step. That's why he told Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus, or you'll never see or inherit the kingdom of, of God and of heaven. You must be born again. That's just the beginning of the Christian walk. If you just got born again three weeks ago, you're a newborn babe in Christ, and you need help in being cared for. That's why the Bible says when you get born again, you need to get in a church and you need a pastor to help feed you the word and teach you whereby you may grow. In fact, it said you desire the sincere, you want the true milk of this word whereby you may grow. But you know, a lot of people get born again and then you never see them again. And then a little while later, there's been no changes in their life. They're still living. And some of them have backslid already back into the way they used to be. They reverted back. Remember the prodigal son? He had everything. He was in his father's house. He's the perfect example of a backslider. He said, give me my inheritance now. And he went out and he got his inheritance and he squandered it on what? The world. He wasted it on women, on drinking, partying. He couldn't be trusted with money because he wasn't mature enough to handle it yet. Turn to Proverbs 31. I wondered if I was going to get to old Lamuel, but we're going to get to Lamuel. Proverbs 31, normally when I say that, what do you think of? The proverbial woman. The woman that can do everything, but the main thing, the point of in that story is that she fears the Lord. The fear of the Lord is what makes that woman special. But I want to talk about the first part of Proverbs 31. I think we'll read verses 1 through 9. Let's just read them real quick. The words of King Lamuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows? Give not your strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lamuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes to drink strong drink, lest, why? lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto that one that is ready to die, to perish. It's not just dying. He says perish. Now, I reckon if you're a sinner, you perish and go ahead and give them some strong drink. But the Bible says you shall not perish but have everlasting life. Perishing would mean dying without God. It says give strong drink to him that's ready to perish and wine to those that be of heavy hearts. The scripture says don't be heavy laden, come unto me. So it sounds like the people that they're giving strong drink and wine to are people that are not, at least we know, don't have the fruit or the promises of God effective in their lives. They're perishing. They're perishing, number one, and then they're heavy-hearted. Let him drink and forget his poverty. So he's also in poverty. And remember his what? His misery no more. So dr strong, this is, y'all listen, this is a prophecy that means it's an inspired utterance of God. 
People tell me, it's okay to drink wine, it's okay to drink strong drink. Well, the word of God through prophecy, look what it says. Number one, the prophecy, that means inspired utterance of God that his mother taught him. Now, I had to study who King Lamuel was, and it is believed that King Lamuel was a nickname that he was called, and it's Solomon. Now, we know Solomon, like Peter, had a great call of God on his life, right? But it sounds like he possibly could be messing up and starting to go in the way of women. And we know Solomon did. Solomon went after the women. And he went after the drinking and the partying. But his mother taught him a prophecy saying, this is not for kings. Well, let me tell you who you, you are today and who I am today. We are kings and priests unto the Lord. And alcohol and wine are not God's will for us. So great a people we are, lest we forget the law and the judgment for the afflicted. Lest that take us back to the things of the world. Most people that drink are trying to forget their misery. Well, when we come to Christ, we don't have that misery anymore. And he gives us the living water that satisfies. Be not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Jesus will give you the Holy Ghost. He'll fill you and you won't need no wine. He gives the new wine. Jesus got some new wine. It's that new, new wine. The kind that makes me feel fine. Come on, it'll make you feel fine. Drink the new wine. It'll make you feel fine. I was looking at how does this fit into what I shared about Peter. Peter had a great call of God on his life, but still Satan was after him to destroy him. Lamuel, which it's believed that his mother would have been Bathsheba, and she probably called him her Lamuel. And she was teaching her son that this didn't need to be in his life for he was called to be a great man of God. And this was going to destroy him. If he went that route, it was going to destroy him. He said, for these things, she said, for these things, destroy kings. I said, I see, Father. I see what you're showing me. Because when I'm seeking the Lord for us, I let him teach me. And sometimes it's hard to grasp what he's trying to show me. You know, I'll say, okay, basically women and booze is not what the king needed. He had a great call of God on his life, and his mother was actually prophesying to him not to go that route. It was going to destroy his life. Amen? The warning to her Lamuel, was for him to not fall into the trap of immorality, of chasing after women and drinking alcohol, was the two warnings she gave him. Look at verse 3. Do not give your strength unto women. When he was given over to chasing women, he gave his very strength over to those women. Neither give your ways to that which destroys kings. Don't do the way 
don't do the things that destroy kings. He was know that chasing women and getting drunk and drinking alcohol was is what destroys kings. Then she very wisely explains that when you drink, you forget. Come on. A lot of people drink to forget because they want to forget something that hurt them or forget something that's bothering them. But there's a better way than drinking to forget. He said, lest you drink and forget the law. And you pervert the judgment. So when a person drinks, their judgment is perverted. How many of you know, because y'all used to drink, y'all did, <laughs> and your judgment became cloudy, to say the least. You did not make good judgment when it come to driving. You ran stop signs. You missed stop lights and all kind of stuff. You thought you was going straight and you was off the road. Even getting behind the wheel wasn't good judgment. Your judgment was way off. You said, oh, I can drive. And everybody around you knows you can't drive and you shouldn't be behind the steering wheel, but according to your judgment, which is perverted now, you can drive, right? I can drive. I can't walk, but I can drive. You ever watch those shows where cops and they say, walk the straight line, and she said, I can, I can do it. I can walk a straight line. And she gets on the line, and she's just all over here falling like this. I just laugh. It's true, though. This is biblical. What I'm telling you is biblical. You don't need that. You don't need it. None of us need it. That's a rebuke. His mother was not only, was it a rebuke? If he was doing it, it might have been a rebuke because it don't tell me as far as I know what age he was. It, nonetheless, it might have been just some good advice. It might have been some teaching. It might have been some instruction. But we know this, it was a prophecy, so it was inspired of God. And that's the criticalness that I took away from it, that it's the word of the Lord. And one we should all learn from and be taught by on how to live as kings and priests unto the Lord our God. Say this, I'm a king and a priest unto the Lord my God. Amen, that's who you are. This is the word helps us to know how to live. It will also sometimes compress you. And say, uh-oh. I'm doing that, and now I know that I'm not supposed to be doing that. So now what? The Bible tells us that we are to come into conformity in both word and deed unto the Lord. Denying our flesh, taking up our cross, and following Jesus. Jesus didn't chase loose women. Jesus didn't get drunk. And neither should we, which not loose women, loose men too, for women. Come on. I don't know, today in this society, it's women chasing women and men chasing men. So, But both of these are examples of what to abstain from. And what to do. Peter and Solomon had great callings of God upon their lives. But they could also be subject to their flesh. And that is the point of the message today. The Bible says don't think too highly of yourself. Take heed when you think you stand lest you fall. Maybe Peter thought out of the twelve I was the one that got the revelation, so I'll just speak next time. And when he spoke the next time, he was totally wrong. He had to learn when to speak and when to be quiet. 
we have to learn the same thing. I'm still learning myself. I'm learning from this. Today, this is good for me. I hope it's good for you, but it's good for me. It helps me to grow up in the Lord. I'll be thinking about this week. You know, as I'm going through my everyday life, I'll be thinking about, you know, be slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to listen, quick to forgive, being merciful. What about this? What if God gave to you the same mercy that you give to others? Would you have a short cord coming back to you of mercy? Where there's no room or even a fault or a mistake? How come we hold other people to standards that we're not willing to hold ourselves to? How come we let ourselves just go out here like this, but then we're going to try to hold somebody else? You mess up one time and Buster, that's it. I'm just going to let you have it. But then when we mess up, we want great mercy from God. And God is checking us out, saying, hmm, whatever a man sows, that he reaps. So be merciful, be kind, be forgiving. Come on, that's what he, he wants us to practice. Was Jesus merciful? Is God merciful? Then we're his children. And we're supposed to be like him, right? So we should be merciful. And if we're not, then we're acting like Satan. We're acting back out like we were before we became children of God. And when we're not grown up, that's usually when we're showing out. But then we want to be something big when we haven't learned to even temper ourselves yet. Jesus had to get Peter ready. And he wasn't ready that day. He needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. He needed to be seriously baptized. Come on. And once that man was there, I don't say he didn't ever make a mistake, but he was prepared. We know when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's with his grace and help that we overcome this flesh. You cannot overcome the flesh by yourself. And if you try to, you're going to fail. You say, well, I'll quit. No sooner than you say it, you'll probably do it. Well, I'll do it. I'll quit. No, you have to sometimes say, God, I can't quit. I cannot do this on my own. I'm going to need my helper, the Holy Spirit. And that's what he is there for, is to help you to live a godly life and get us in conformity with God's will. Can I hear an amen? I want to encourage you this morning. I'm not going to share any more of the word. I think you probably had a we good We hope you appetite. enjoyed today's message. To see more messages like this one, to support or interact with our outreach ministry, please visit our YouTube or Facebook page, Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. If you're in the area, come and visit us at 9437 West U.S. Highway 84 in Newton, Alabama. See you there.